So, good morning. Um, my name is Frank Gunsing. I will talk to you about an introduction to R matrix theory, the R matrix formalism, and neutron induced uh, reactions. Um, so, I'm working at CEA in Saclay in France, and now I'm on leave uh, at CERN in Geneva. So, that is why I have two logos because CERN, they paid my travel to here, so I need to acknowledge them. Um, first, what does it mean, this uh, neutron induced reactions um, and, and R matrix? So, we have to limit first the energy scale of the neutrons uh, where we are looking at. So, if you have we are interested in this compound nucleus reaction part. So, and you see here three different types of reactions. If we go to very low neutron kinetic, kinetic energies, uh, let's say in the scale of a few milli electron volt, then you can also associate to this kinetic energy a particle with energy has also an associated wavelength. And that wavelength is in the order of nanometers. And in that case, the size of the wavelength is comparable to the distances between atoms in, uh, in any solid state material. So the neutron is not interacting with every nucleus individually, but with the, the, the structure of the material. So with, uh, with the crystal or the liquid or whatever it is, but it is seeing the, the, the solid state as, as a full uh, as a crystal lattice. And in that case, all the physics that is uh, happening there is, uh, is based on solid state physics. So you can indeed see the structure of, of molecules, of, uh, of uh, crystal lattices, of, and that kind of things. And that is used, for example, in, in this milli electrovolt region, uh, especially with uh, thermal neutron reactors, for example. And then if you go up higher in energy, of course, there is a region where both um, phenomena occur, so you get solid state physics and nuclear physics. Nuclear physics means that the neutron is really reacting with a nucleus and not anymore with the atoms. And, and let's say in the region between one milli electron volt up to roughly 10 mega electron volt, uh, the wavelength is such that it sees the neutron sees directly the nucleus, and then you get this neutron <coughs> compound, uh, uh, compound nuclear reactions. And if you go even higher in energy, uh, the, the wavelength becomes very small, and then the wavelength is comparable to the size of the nucleus inside the nucleus. So to single nucleons, single protons or neutrons inside the nucleus, and then you get reactions that, uh, that are really based on, on, on a single knockout of, of, of protons, neutrons, or other what we call direct reactions. <coughs> and the time scale of direct reactions is much faster than this compound nucleus reaction. Because for the compound nucleus reaction, the, the, the energy that becomes available, I will come back to that later, is distributed to the whole compound nucleus, so which is a new nucleus based on the original target nucleus and the neutron, they come together and all the energy that is, becomes available is dissipated through that. So you get a compound nucleus which is in an excited state and then you can get different uh, reactions that may occur with this compound nucleus. So our matrix, that is what I'm going to talk about, is related to this part, so this energy region. Uh, then we have this neutron nucleus reactions, which can uh, be written in, the, in several ways. So, so usually you have a, a nucleus, call it X, for example. You have a particle that goes in. Uh, in our case, that's a neutron. And you get, let's say, two different exit particles. So it's a binary reaction. You can write that in different ways. And examples of real live uh, reactions are, for example, boron-10 plus a nucleus gives lithium-7 plus helium-4, which is also an alpha particle. So you can write that in these equivalent ways. And the short way is just to write uh, born 10 and alpha, because then you can always count back to what was the exiting particle. So that is a way how we write these type of reactions. And then you can get different reactions of uh, neutron-induced reactions, like elastic scattering, 
where you emit a neutron with the same energy as it was coming in, that is no energy transfer or whatever, you can get inelastic scattering. Uh, so the, the exiting neutron has a different energy, so there is some energy transfer uh, between the, the particles. You can get N gamma reactions, just capture uh, it's called, or fission reactions, NF, or charged particle emissions like uh, uh, N alpha, N, N P, proton emission, or NXN, several neutron reactions. That is also possible. And if you sum up all these reactions, then you get something what is known as the total cross section. So that means any reaction that could occur. Uh, you lump it into this total cross-section, which is an important quantity in neutron-induced reaction theory because it is one of the few that you can really calculate with some models in some energy ranges. So these cross-sections, uh, usually what you have is a, a cross-section is in fact the related to the interaction probability. That is a cross-section, but it has different units. It has units of, uh, of square meters. I come back to that. Or barns, which is a little bit more easy to grab as a, as a number. Um, you, the cross-section, what you have is a function of the incoming particle. But if you start with this, you have an outgoing particle, y and b, and you have an angle with that. And the most basic um, quantity is a double differential cross-section, which is as a function of the incoming particle, but also as a function of the outgoing angle and particle energy. And that is double differential cross-section. Then you can integrate that over the outgoing angles or the outgoing energies, and then you get what is called a differential cross-section always as a function of the ingoing, incoming particle, but integrated either over the outgoing energy or the outgoing angle. And then if you integrate this one, you come back to what is called just the cross-section, and it's a double integral of this double differential cross-section, but it is still a function of the outgoing energy. So that is a real cross-section, always as a function of a neutron energy. You can also integrate this, and then you get an integrated cross-section, integrated over a flux, over something, whatever you want. So, and how does it look in a range at low energy? So, this is an example of uranium-235 plus a neutron. And I spoke already that, I told you already that there were different reactions possible, and here you see uh, four different reaction cross-sections. The total cross-section, in black here, uh, and a few partial cross-sections, which are just uh, part, uh, summing up, up to the total cross-section, like the elastic scattering, the red line here, uh, capture, the blue line here, and uranium-35, as we know, it is fissile at low energy, so, uh, and that is the green one, so the green uh, curve is the, is the fission cross-section. I will show later again this picture, but this one comes back. So what we see here from this picture is that we have peaks in these cross-sections, in all these cross-sections, and these peaks occur at exactly the same energy. There is one energy at which there is a peak in all the cross-sections. And then the shapes are different, of course. The sizes are different, and, and that is normal, but the peaks are still there. And these peaks in the reaction cross-section, we call that resonances. And the origin of these resonances, uh, well, I, I will explain that, is related just to, to, to excited states in the compound nucleus. And these excited states, um, because this excitation energy is so high, you cannot predict them. They, they are just there, and you have to measure them somehow. And once you know them, this will help you to reconstruct cross-sections in a very nice, clear, clean way, and you can even broaden the cross-sections, which are normally at zero Kelvin, at zero temperature, to something which is our daily life temperature at 300 Kelvin, for example, which is a little bit different, the cross-section then. That is called Doppler broadening, but the Doppler broadened cross-section is something that we can use in daily life, and it comes all back to these resonances uh, and, and how to treat them with uh, this R matrix formalism. 
let's go back now to, uh, to neutron fluxes because I told you there is this energy range from very low to very high, neutron kinetic energy. But if we look at where the neutrons are coming from to make these reactions, uh, for example, if you have thermal neutrons that induce fission, for example, on uranium-235. What you get is fission products and new neutrons. And these neutrons have this type of distribution, which is a uh, maximal uh, Boltzmann distribution because it's a kind of thermal spectrum for the neutrons, but they are peaked at, let's say, 1 MeV. Um, and this thermal fission cross-section uh, uh, the, this, this distribution of, of neutrons uh, is, the, these are fast neutrons. So they are created with just thermal neutrons. You can create these fast neutrons which occur when, when some nucleus is fissile. Then in a reactor, of course, there's lots of water to moderate the neutrons, and moderation means that you slow down the neutrons. So you have originally fast neutrons, and then you go back to, to, to lower kinetic energies, and if you do that a long time, an infinite time, with an infinite amount of water, you get a water-moderated neutron spect spectrum, which is, again, a Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution. And, of course, uh, if you plot that on a log-log scale and you, you, you scale these factors so that they are at the same height, you get an identical representation of this uh, Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution. And this is um, the 25 milli electron volt distribution, uh, which is in fact uh, going much broader than just one, one energy, but that is a typical water-moderated neutron spectrum, which we see. Now, you can get everything in between, of course, uh, for these neutrons, and in some stars, red giants, for example, and I think you had a, a lecture last, last week about this, you get also uh, neutron Newtons, and they have also a thermal spectrum, but uh, at a little bit different temperatures, depending on the temperature there. And the neutrons there, uh, you, you have these red giants, it's usually between 5 and 100 kT, that is, uh, that is the, uh, the, the, the temperature, so it's between 5 and 100 kV, you get these, um, these type of distributions. So. So neutron-induced reactions are important over the whole energy range here for any nuclear fission technology, nuclear reactors, and in between also for stellar spectrum, stellar astrophysics. So it's a double use, let's say, of these type of, of reactions. Now, if you look again on this, the same energy scale where we had uh, all the neutrons here, so you see here again all these reactions, the 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 now this is a different nucleus, this is uh, uranium-238, but that doesn't matter. You have again fission here in green, you have capture in blue, and, uh, and, and, and total here in red. And if you go higher up in energy, you see even the reactions like the NN prime or NXN reactions, and these are threshold reactions, so they, they, they start only at an energy high enough to make these reactions occur. Other reactions, on the contrary, they start immediately. There is no limit, so even with a neutron of nearly zero uh, kinetic energy, just enough to reach the neutron, <coughs> you get already these reactions, which may be very high. Uh, very high. And now, if we put these two, um, th this plot which I just show you of the distribution of neutrons, and here the reactions that can occur, you see uh, this is the same energy scale here, you see in which region, which type of reactions you can expect. So at high energies, uh, in high fission reactions, for example, you get all these um, threshold reactions, and in prime, and XN. And this is then, of course, important if you have, um, let's say, fast reactors or, or accelerator-driven reactors, or new concepts of reactions. These type of reactions become important. And if you go to lower energies, all this resonance region here, because that, that is occurring in any reactor, is important. And of course, you have this zone where you have completely moderated reactors, and there you have the thermal, uh, thermal energy range that is important. So now, this is our typical extreme situations where we can expect typical uh, neutron distributions. 
these are the type of reactions that we can expect. And of course, this looks different for different nuclei. If you have a different nucleus, uh, the peaks, may, these resonances may occur at a higher or lower energy range. Also, the thresholds reactions may occur at lower and higher um, energies. So you have to look at that for every nucleus differently. But this is an example. And now, where can we study this type of reactor, uh, reactions? Well, then you have to go to facilities. For example, to uh, a, a thermal neutron reactor. For example, the IML, you can study. You have a lot of neutrons in this, uh, in this moderated, uh, in this thermal region. So lots of neutrons, and you can study neutron-induced reactions there. You can go to higher energies. Uh, but then you have usually monoenergetic um, uh, neutron sources using accelerators, and you get... Uh, well, we say monoenergetic, but it's, it's a kind of distribution, but you get single energies, and this is very efficient to study reactions, uh, for example, these uh, threshold reactions, or some fission reactions also. And the advantage of this type of, um, of machines is that you get a lot of neutrons in the particular energy range. There is another way to, to address the whole energy range at once, and that is to use uh, as we call a wide pulsed neutron source. So you use a time of flight technique to, to, to go over all the energies, which is nice, you cover everything, but the disadvantage is, of course, that all the intensity of neutrons that you have is diluted over the full energy range. So you get much less uh, neutrons at the specific energies where you have other tools that can create much uh, higher fluxes at given energies. But these are the type of machines that we use to study uh, this region of interest for, for neutron-induced reactions. Is that important uh, to know um, neutron-induced reactions and, uh, and, and do we really care? So, well, this is an example of the transmission of iron. Uh, so we have uh, iron is used as a, as a as a, as a shielding material in reactors, for example, and if you have a shield of iron, uh, you can stop neutrons if you take a thick layer of iron. And you get something, uh, a transmission that is something like, uh, that can be like this. But as you see from this plot, this total cross-section, suddenly there is a kind of dip here, and that is the interference between um, uh, potential and elastic scattering. Okay, that's a detail, but the result is that you get a dip in the total cross-section. So if you calculate uh, the shielding for uh, a particular, um, for, for, for a kind of average uh, cross-section, then you see that at this uh, particular energy, all the neutrons go through because the total cross-section, which is uh, giving you the transmission of the neutrons through that shielding, is much lower at that energy. So all the neutrons go through there. So it is really important to know these things uh, in detail at uh, detailed um, at, at several energies. So I already spoke that uh, spoke to you th that the um, a neutron particle it's it's a particle, but you can associate a wavelength to that. So then we come to the uh, uh, region of quantum physics. So. We have classical physics where you have particles that's, that are just uh, interacting using Newton's laws of motion, and that is uh, easily understandable because we can uh, imagine that. The other world, if we go to very small particles alone, then something else becomes important, and that is quantum physics. And that works, um, that is important if you are on this small scale. Uh, you can say a chair here is also made of particles, but there's so many of them that finally the, the resulting uh, uh, effect of all these quantum effects is re uh, finally you get the classical physics, uh, so the normal Newton physics of, of, of movement of a chair. But if you go down to the level of a single particle, a single nucleus, a single neutron that interacts with a neutrus, nucleus, then you need to go to um, quantum physics, and uh, so uh, this, this is um, 
something important to understand this R matrix uh, thing. Now I know some of you have done this at school for, uh, for a long time, others don't, so I will go th through this uh, rather quickly, but uh, just to give you a grasp of, of what, what it means. This quantum physics is that you have the probability of observing a particle at a time and a position, and that is related not to uh, absolute certainty, but there is a kind of uh, um, probability. And that probability is given by what we call the wave function. The wave function psi uh, multiplied by its complex conjugate gives you the probability of observing this particle at a given time, at a given position. So the two at the same, you are never sure it is a probability. And that is the, the, the whole problem. Uh, and that wave function you need to obtain. Once you obtain that, you have this probability and you can solve it. And the idea is that this wave function is just a solution of what we call the Schrodinger equation. The Schrodinger equation is very simple. Uh, I will come back to that later. Um, but that has been postulated by this person, Erwin Schrödinger, and he said, okay, every quantum particle should obey this equation, and when it does, we have the wave function, and when we have the wave function, we have the probability to observe it at a given time, a given place. And to give you an example of how this was discovered, so let's go back to uh, a quantum system which was... Uh, one of the most simple quantum systems, which is the hydrogen atom, because you have one proton and an electron orbiting around it. And that is the most simple quantum system which we can observe, and that, and that gives really quantum uh, effects. Um, so you can, well, w what was observed by the time when this was uh, discovered is that uh, when you have transitions between the electron states, uh, you, you give it energy and then it starts to emit radiation and by chance this radiation was a visible light, so this could be seen, but it was not some continuous spectrum, it was very discrete. So this light, for example, you have this um, proton and an electron orbiting around it and it was found that if you give it some energy, you, 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 you have enough energy to move one electron to the next orbit around it, and then it decays back, and when it decays back, it emits this radiation, and this radiation is can, for hydrogen is visible light. And if you go back to more, uh, you feed in more different energies, you get a kind of spectrum of, of, of visible energies that are going out. And this is the excitation spectrum of the hydrogen at atom. And there is, all these lines have been determined and they were visible as lights. You can see there, so you have all kinds of colors which corresponds to different series of transitions between the ele electron orbits. And wh what we see as a single line is in fact many different lines. They correspond to all these uh, excitations, uh, orbits and transitions between the orbits of the electrons that are orbiting around the hydrogen <coughs> atom. So that was, uh, in fact, a, a, pro a proof. Uh, it was um, a very helpful observation to develop the quantum mechanics. And then we come to the Schrodinger equation. So these transitions, if you, this is the wave function, and this is the Schrodinger equation. So it's Nothing more than a double differential, uh, um, double differential, uh, differential equation, and where you have a kind of potential, which may be the, the Coulomb potential of the hydrogen atom, and uh, and what uh, that that is really the potential that the uh, electron is feeling, and um, you have energies here, and this is the the double uh, the double derivative, so. If you solve this equation, so you need to know, there are two unknowns. One is the, the potential, so you can give some Coulomb potential or something, mm -hmm. and then you can solve this. And what you will get are solutions for psi and E, so energies and the wave function. So the energies will then correspond exactly to this excitation spectrum of the, of the hydrogen atom. Um, 
and, and usually this is then grouped into something what we call the Hamiltonian, and people working on, uh, um, on optical model calculation, for example, they need to work with potentials, and the potential is the most difficult part to get at. It's not solving the equation. You take any computer, you can solve the equation. The, the difficult part is what do you put for the potential, because that is the real physics uh, governing the whole system. So, once you solve this, you get a solution, and the solution gives you the energies and the wave functions, and the wave functions gives you all that you would like to have. So, we can do an exercise on that, and that is making a simple system, which is just a single particle. This is here, and, um, so the, and, and it cannot go beyond this region here. So, this is an exercise that you find in textbooks, and you can solve that, because this is one of the few things, let's say, that you can solve uh, yourself. And because we can, let's do it. So you find, you solve this equation with the things that are given here. You get a solution for the psi and the energy. So you see here, the discretization of the energies is coming up here. It's because that is the solution of, the, of this uh, uh, Schrodinger equation. And that is why we have discrete states here, because it's just uh, obeying to this second order differential equation. That's the whole trick. Uh, and then the wave function, we can plot them as well. They look like this, so they are sine-like uh, quantities. And if you want to know the probability, then you have to, to multiply them, you have to square it. And that is, I think, both curves. I draw them here on, on top. So one is the sine, and the other is the sine squared. That is the whole thing. Now you can go to more difficult uh, situations. You can invent some... Uh, well, so here you have a finite well, so now the potential doesn't go to infinity, but to zero. It's another exercise, another one of the few that you still can work out yourself without any computer. And then if you do that, uh, you see here the first problem, because now the potential doesn't go to infinity, but it goes to zero. And that means that the wave function can exist even outside the, 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 this, this well. It was not the case before, because that was going to infinity. So there's no wave function uh, beyond the limit. But now we have something that is there. Uh, you have to do several tricks. You have to cut this region in, in pieces, uh, because here the potential is uh, V0, minus V0. Here the potential is 0. You have to solve the equations. And then the trick is you have to match the value and derivative at the borders. And once you do that, you have your uh, equation that obeys the Schrodinger equation, and you have your final solution. So this matching value and derivative is also a trick uh, from uh, Schrodinger to have something that would uh, work uh, with, uh, with what we know, would correspond to our observations of nature in the quantum field. And once you do that, of course, you, this is a little bit more complicated, but uh, it is working, and you get um, something uh, that looks like this. So I didn't plot here the real functions because they are a little bit complicated, but again, it's a sine type, uh, sinus type inside the well and a decaying thing outside the well. So you can match that. It's a discontinuous function, but it matches value and derivative at the borders. And then there is another trick here, that is that if we have a wave function, um, these, are, these, these uh, discrete levels are also called eigenstates, because in, it's a German word, because the Germans were doing this, uh, the eigenstates were invented uh, to solve this type of, uh, of, uh, of equations. And the eigenstates here, which corresponds with eigenfunctions, are the uh, are the, uh, the wave functions and the eigenstates are the energy levels, so these are the solutions of this equation, and you get that, and you can expand the full wave function, which covers everything, as a linear combination of the, of the participating uh, wave functions. And if you do that, so if you know the eigenstates, you can get the final wave function which describes the whole system. 
And that is another trick which uh, will come back in our matrix later. Uh, well, we can go to many other uh, things that we can measure, for example, a potential barrier. So you have a freely moving particle. There is a kind of potential on its way. So the wave function is modified there again. And then it goes back, it, it, it travels further. There is some reflection and transmission, but then the wave function uh, continues. And again, you have this matching of the value and the derivative at the borders because you have different equations inside the well and outside the well. Or here, it's a barrier. So inside the barrier or outside the well. Okay, solutions are given here. So they are still uh, comprehensive, let's say. Um, so here you have this trans traveling, transmission, reflection, transmission, reflection. And here, of course, this goes to infinity. There is no reflection. Of course, you see this is a one-dimensional case with very simple uh, thing, uh, <laughs> simple potentials. Now, when things become more complicated, uh, that is if you have three dimensions instead of one. And if you have more complex uh, potentials, and then things become so complicated, you have to use computers. And uh, there are still a few cases where you get, get something mathematically just uh, on, the, on a piece of paper. But in most cases, you need numerical solutions of this wave function. Uh, so I was talking before about um, an electron orbiting around a proton. But we can also see the... The, the nucleus as a quantum system, because again, you have a set of particles, which are now just protons and neutrons. Uh, there is a potential, and the potential is generated by all the other particles around. So the nucleus itself, the nucleons, are generating their own potential. And every nucleon is feeling this potential from the other nucleons. So there is a potential. We have a set of quantum particles. It's not one, but it's, it's several. So complications are there, it's uh, three dimensions. Uh, we don't know exactly what is a realistic potential. Usu well, what is done is usually a Wood-Saxon potential to start with, but it can be more complicated. And then we get the same thing, but now we have not one particle, we have more particles. We have not one type family of nucleons. We have two types, we have the neutrons and the protons. And again, we get an excitation spectrum, but at every energy, uh, the level is degenerate, which means that you can have more particles in a, separate, in a shell. This is called a shell, uh, every excited state. And then uh, you can get, for example, oxygen-16, which is nice because all the shells are filled with the particles that can be in. But you have also oxygen-17, when you have one more particle. Where should it go? It goes in the next shell, which has a lot of possibilities, but uh, only one of these holes is filled with this particle. Uh, or you have one less, of course. So you have this type of variation. And how does it work if you have a nucleus and you consider that as a quantum system? That means that you have, uh, this is what we call the shell model representation of a nucleus. So you have two potentials, one for the neutrons, one for the protons. The protons, of course, because it's charged, it is, uh, has some barrier to overcome, the Coulomb barrier. The neutron is different, it goes to zero. Um, so in the ground state, everything is filled. So you have, uh, you have something like that. Um, and in a picture of excited states, if you would like to give that excited states, you have this nucleus, and it is in the ground state, we call that. So it's the lowest possible state of energy that it can have. If by some means you could put in some energy into this compound nucleus, so it's in such a way that you go to the first excited state, so then this first excited state corresponds to a kind of configuration of the nucleus, of the, of the neutrons and the protons in their possible shells. So for example, this is just an example, it corresponds to the, this, this uh, neutron here, which was first here, and now it is here. So it is in an excited state. And then you can go to the second excited state, which might correspond to two neutrons here. Or maybe it was, well, this one in a little higher state. It can be anything. The thing is that if you go up in, in excitation, so you feed in more and more energy to this nuclear system, then 
you, you become, uh, at, at, I don't know, the hundredth excited state, and which may correspond to a certain particle hole configuration. That is how we call, call it, because you have these shells, and some of them have a particle, others have not. And this particle hole configuration is very complicated, especially if you have a lot of nucleus, uh, nucleon, <coughs> nucleons, because then it becomes more complicated even. And that is quantum chaos. So if we look now at a real nucleus, for example, let's start with something light, lithium-7. You see here the eigenstates of this lithium-7, and here carbon-12. And you see if you go up in energy, then there are more and more um, uh, states that are possible. And they, this is exactly the level scheme, how we call it, because these are levels that exist in a nucleus, and every level corresponds to an excited state. Now, if we go to a heavier nucleus, there are so many levels, we cannot count them. So we, here you see just a lower part of the excitation energy. You see all the transitions that are gamma ray transitions, because we are in a nucleus. If we are talking about electron transitions, then we talk about X-rays. If we talk about nuclear transitions, we talk about gamma rays. And the gamma ray transitions that have been observed, and which gives us a clue about the level scheme, are, um, are here. And of course, you, it goes, there are many more if you go higher in energy. For example, here is again the lower part of lead, 208. Lots of uh, states, you can see them here. These are only the observed states. Maybe there are many more which we have not observed because we did not have the right reactions to populate or to observe all these states. And there are a lot. Uranium-8, of course, here you see it's, again, only the lower part. And the general picture is like this. So you have a ground state. You have all these excited states. And you can have a lot of states, finally. If you go, for example, to a nucleus like uh, uranium-238, so it's a quite heavy nucleus. If you go from the ground state up to an excited state, which is so high that a neutron which is inside this nucleus can just fly away, it's not bound anymore by the nucleus, you have about 400,000 levels, which is really a lot. And so you cannot count every level. Uh, you can do that only at low energy, but at higher energy, uh, you, you cannot count the levels anymore. So you talk more about level density, so which is a, some number, average number of levels that you would expect in a tiny interval of nuclear energy. So at low energy, the separation between these levels is very low, uh, is very high. And the separation uh, for uranium, for example, can be in the order of, let's say, 100 kilo electron volts. So these are the type of transitions that we see also. So it's KV gamma rays. Uh, if you go up to that energy where the neutrons uh, can just fly away, uh, typically it's around 10 MeV above the ground state. And of course, this depends on the nucleus. Usually, it ranges between 4 and 11 MeV for, to cover uh, nearly all of the nuclei, stable nuclei that we know on Earth. And if you go higher, uh, and at this energy, the level spacing, because it becomes more and more compressed, is much smaller. So the spacing of the level is only 10 electron volt there for a typical nu nucleus. Eh? Again, it depends on the nucleus. But you see that this spacing is much smaller here than at low excitation energy. Um, and that is exactly, the spacing is what we see when we uh, make, collide a neutron with a nucleus. Because then, what happens? Uh, you have this nucleus, uh, a target nucleus, which is in its ground state. You add a neutron, and instead of supplying so much energy that you can that the neutron is not bound anymore. Now the neutron is coming from the outside to the nucleus, and this energy, what you would add to the system to make it go away, becomes now available to the, to the, to the nucleus. And we call that the compound nucleus. So neutron with, let's say, zero, nearly zero kinetic energy enters uh, a nucleus, and suddenly it gets 10 MeV for free, which is just the binding energy of these neutrons. So this compound nucleus has 10 MeV for free, and it is in a very highly excited state. And then we can get reactions. And these reactions is exactly what we see here. 
these are the resonances in the cross section. Because if you look here, the, ex the kinetic energy of the neutron, which the zero is here, uh, and for every state corresponds here to an ex uh, every resonance observed in the cross section corresponds to an excited uh, nuclear state. Um, so that is the picture that we see. And when we look at these cross section uh, uh, plots, we always know that even if we see an electron, uh, uh, a resonance at one electron volt, we know that it is at several MeV above the ground state. It corresponds to that particular level. And of course, once it's there, it can decay to the ground state. For example, by gamma ray emission. But that is just one of the possibilities. Once the, the excited compound nucleus is there, it can also re-emit the, the neutron that created it. And then you go, go back to this situation. So you have elastic scattering. Or if the energy is high enough, that is the threshold is coming in, if the kinetic energy of the incoming neutrons is high enough, it can go back to an excited state. So you have neutron inelastic scattering. Or you can have fission because it is so high, the excitation energy, that, that you are above the fission barrier and, and the nucleus just fissions. So <coughs> a typical nucleus nucleus is made up of nucleons, so we have neutrons and protons, and if we put that on a scale here, we have, uh, uh, we have all the available uh, nuclei that exist in nature or have been observed once. They are not all stable, not at all, but there are about uh, 4,000 of them. Uh, only a few of them are really stable, and the stable ones, uh, they, they, they are somewhere in the middle, and if we add neutrons here on this side for a nucleus, then it just doesn't fit anymore. They, they, they don't want to uh, merge into a new nucleus, so no way to get in here, and we call that the neutron drip line, because any neutron that you try to add to the system just drips away, it, it goes away. Same thing for the protons. For certain nuclei, if you, you, it cannot just hold more protons, it's not possible. And the stable ones are here, so it's, it's just uh, very few of them. And all the others are not stable by definition because the same ones are here. They contain too many neutrons or too many protons and they want just to decay back to this stable nuclei. And that is what we call radioactivity. Usually it's a beta decay or a beta plus or electron capture depending on which side of the valley of stability you are. This is called valley of stability. Um, and um, Okay, so Dan has already mentioned this valley of stability. This is what we know, and maybe at very high here, there are other configurations which may, again, uh, make some new uh, stable nuclei or short-lived nuclei. Uh, and, and you see here, if the nucleus is heavy enough, there are enough protons and neutrons, then you can get even a spontaneous alpha emission. So then it's better for the nucleus to just throw away an alpha particle, so then it is in a lower uh, uh, energy configuration. Um, I just talked to you also about this neutron separation energy, which, uh, which, which I said was between 4 and, uh, and 11 MeV. I put here 10, to, to, but there, is, there are a few nuclei between 11. And you see something strange here. Of course, you would expect here that if you have already a lot of neutrons, then of course the neutron is less bound, so it is easier to, th to get away of a neutron. And on the contrary, if you have not so many neutrons, but you have more protons than neutrons, then of course the neutron is more tightly bound to the nucleus and the separation energy is more on the blue side, which is more strongly bound. And then you see another effect here, which is uh, you have light blue and, and red blue, and light red and red, and dark red and light red, that means there is a kind of odd-even effect. And that means, it, it's also a well-known phenomenon, that is the pairing of the nucleons, because if they are by two, they are more tightly uh, bound, they, they are strongly bound, and uh, it takes more energy to separate them. So that you see here in the reflection of the neutron separation energy. Something about fission, I told you if the nucleus is above the fission 
threshold, the, every nucleus has a kind of, uh, of fissional, uh, fission threshold. So it needs to have enough uh, intrinsic energy, so excitation energy, to be fissionable. And um, of course, every nucleus has a kind of uh, fission barrier. And it's not so much different for the uranium-235 and the uranium-238. The fission barrier is 6.2 MeV for uranium-236, which is uranium-235 plus neutron. And for uranium-239, which is 238 plus neutron, the fission barrier is 6.6. .6, so it's very comparable. But the whole thing of why uh, uranium-235 is fish, uh, fissions with thermal neutrons and 238 doesn't is related to this binding energy because that is again this odd even effect. They are very close, but we have this odd even effect. And we see here uh, uranium 235 binding energy is 6.5, and here it's only 4.8. So the binding energy is much lower. So uranium 238 plus neutron, it is not in a high enough excitation energy to be fissionable. So it doesn't fission unless you give it more kinetic energy, and then you are in this region, and you will start to fission. Uranium-235 is different, because this binding energy is so high that if you add zero kinetic energy neutron to, uh, let's say, a thermal neutron to uranium-235, immediately it gains uh, so much uh, excitation energy, and it is above the the, the fission, fission barrier, let's say. So it is fissionable, that means uh, uh, at this energy. So it is fissile, and fissile means you can fission it with thermal neutrons. So fissile, thermal neutrons work, fissionable, every nucleus is fissionable if you give it high enough energy. So what does it mean, these resonances, which I just showed you? Uh, so it is an eigenstate, we, we just show, we have all these eigenstates, and, and it's the excited state, and they want to go back to the ground state, because that is energetically uh, a more favorable configuration. And the time does it take, the time that it takes to go from an excited state down to the ground state, uh, that is what we call the lifetime of this excited state. And this lifetime, um, I, I, again, if you go back to the, to the wave function, there is a kind of, you see it here, it is the lifetime, it's an exponential. So the lifetime uh, of this state, because it's not there forever, it's not a stationary state, it is a, a time-dependent state. And this lifetime, or the tau, which is not exactly the half-life, but uh, let's call it lifetime, you can associate a width to that. And if you can see the energy profile of this state here, it looks somehow like that, with a kind of width, and that width is exactly related to the lifetime of this excited state. So once you know the lifetime, you know the, the width. And the width, uh, they are linked together, of course, and that is, um, well, you, you can look that up in, in any textbook of quantum mechanics, it's the Fourier transform effect of, the, of this, wave function, time dependent, to the energy uh, profile. So it's a different domain, but it's the same thing. So we have this, uh, this very specific form, and this is called a bright Wigner form, and this comes back in any problem of, uh, of quantum states which have a finite lifetime, not only in, in nuclear physics, also in molecular physics, uh, it's there in, in uh, particle physics, very high uh, energy. You have always this bright weakness form. It comes back all the time. And this bright weakness form is, um, is fundamental for, um, to describe resonances. It is the basic shape. And then, of course, you have very much variations, but I will come back to that later. So is there another way to... Uh, to, to see this uh, neutron nucleus reaction, not another way, but what can you imagine if you have a current of particles, which are neutrons, impinging on a neutron, or on a nucleus, and this nucleus is in fact just, uh, you can see that as a potential well. So that is the nucleus. So you have the neutron seeing a potential well, which is the nucleus. 
So when the neutron is incident, it's just a plane wave. And when it is scattered, it is again a plane wave. It's not a plane wave anymore, but a radial wave. So it is going in all directions. That is the possibility, at least. And uh, what should be preserved is uh, the, what, what we call a probability density, which is just uh, the current of particles. So what comes in must go out. That is the whole thing. So what goes out in, in all directions from 4 pi is uh, what goes in if you have an incident wave which comes in. And this conservation of this probability density, wh which can be written like this in terms of wave functions, it's a current density, it's called. And that is what we call the cross-section. It is the outgoing current divided by the ingoing current. And of course, normalized because this goes over uh, 4 pi. It is radial. So we have this r square that comes in here, uh, which is the, the r is, is, is the radius. And you see here immediately why the units of cross-section is Barnes. Because it is here, you have the meter, the square meter coming in, and Barnes is square meter. So solving the Schrodinger equation to get cross-sections, it is important. And I told you before, there was one way to get all the eigenstates. And that is, uh, or to get the wave functions. That is knowing all the eigenstates. That is one uh, one method, and that is the R matrix uh, theory with resonances. Resonances correspond to excited states, so you have all the eigenstates, and you can construct a cross section with that. The other thing is to know uh, the the potential, which is the, the the optical potential, which is used in optical model um, optical modeling of the nucleus, and then you can. Uh, also calculate eigenstates. It's not done in this way, it's, it's more shortcut, but the principle is, is, is going back to that. So it's calculating the eigenstates of the, of the potential and calculate what goes out and from what goes in by using a right model. So there are different energy regions where you should use one or the other approach. So usually this potential works well if there are not really resonances anymore, because resonances, you have to be very uh, precise about particular states. But if you can average things out, like at higher energies, then you can use that approach, and you use optical model uh, calculations to calculate cross-sections. Not all cross-sections, unfortunately, but the total cross-sections you can calculate, and you, you have to use other models, other theories, to find the partial components of this total cross-section. But if you go to lower energies, where you see really the resonances in, uh, in the cross-sections that you observe, then you have to work with our matrix, and that is using the properties of every level and convert that in a cross-section. Because that is what we want at the end, express the cross-section as that. And for that, we use the R matrix formalism. So we have... Uh, so it, it's a bit complicated, but I will just go through it, and at the end I will give a reference, and if you have some time, next week, y y it takes a lot of time, you can go through that reference. Uh, so you have an incoming wave function, it's written like that, outgoing wave functions, and you have something that does something to this wave function, and that is the real physics of the thing, which we don't know, which we cannot calculate, we can just observe what happens. And that we call collision matrix. So all the physics of the interaction is inside that, um, that what we call collision matrix. Uh, so we call that U. And then every cross-section, cross-section is one particle configuration to another one. The probability of that is given by this collision matrix. It is how this uh, outgoing wave is transformed by uh, how the ingoing wave is transformed into the outgoing wave by the collision matrix. And once you have that, uh, it's fine. <coughs> so we have three different um, uh, regions, let's say. We have an entrance channel where we have a neutron and a nucleus. They are not interacting. They are just approaching each other. And uh, so they are separate particles, which means uh, we can we have what we call the external region, 
uh, we can solve the equation, the Schrodinger equation. So that is the easy part, let's say. Same thing for the exit channel when we have, for example, an outgoing neutron and an outgoing particle. Again, you have two separate particles not interacting with each other. If you have a charged particle reaction, then the interaction is easy. It is a Coulomb interaction, so you can still solve the problem. But the difficult part is once they are together, they are a compound nucleus, and then there is no way to calculate this, uh, to, to solve the Schrodinger equation. And then what we use is this trick of decomposing the wave function into its eigenstates. And the eigenstates are all the resonances that we know from experiments. And once we know the resonances, we know the eigenstates, we can fix the things together, and we have, again, a wave function which allows us to calculate the cross-section. So that is the principle. Sorry. Is there a delta? Inside of the ah, okay. Yeah, delta, it's, it's this uh, Kronecker delta, which is uh, just one or zero. Yeah, sorry, yeah. Yeah, this is, this is a way, uh, let's say a formal way to write this cross-section. We talk about channels, which is not, uh, usually is not, it's, it's not something we observe in, in, uh, in, in nature, because we don't have all this, uh, all this uh, decomposition in, in, uh, of, of the configuration into orbital momenta, in spin, etc. We have to sum up certain things. So real observables are sums of, of channels, let's say, of channels. But this is the most basic uh, quantity. And this cross-section, I, I will show a few other uh, equations based on that. So how to find the wave function? So in this external region was easy because no, there is no interaction, so that is that the whole uh, potential is, uh, is either zero or just a column potential, so it is easy to model. And of course, now we are in three dimensions, so it's a little bit more complicated. Usually we do that, we can separate the parts in three dimensions. You need three variables, and the most easy thing is to use a radius and a theta and a phi for the two angles, and then you can split in this wave function, the radial part and the angular part, you can solve them separately. So you see, it's a, it's a little bit more involved than the one-dimensional case when there was nothing in which you could still do yourself. So if we have this radial part, because that is giving the trouble, you, you see that, you, you, you can uh, write the Schrodinger equation in a different way, which is like that. And what, what comes out is something that, uh, that has been solved uh, in the 19th, no, 18th century. Um, special case of, uh, well, the normal solution of this is what we call Coulomb functions. And that is why we have, this works also with charged particles. We have a proton, for example. You have a Coulomb function. And you have a special case, that is, there is no charge, there is no Coulomb, fun uh, Coulomb interaction. So the, the V is zero, there is no, Interaction, and then you have the special case of the Coulomb function, which are the Bessel functions. And the Bessel functions, they look very much like a sinus. A sinus, not exactly. Now, you have to do the internal region, which is difficult. You cannot solve the Schrodinger equation. So what you have to do is to, to do this wave function, decompose it as a linear combination of its eigenstates, and we use a special quantity for that, which is called the R matrix, which does exactly that, which links the properties of every excited state, which is the E, these are the energies of lambda, and lambda is the excited state of the compact nucleus, and every lambda has also what is called here a, a small gamma, but uh, that is just related to the half-life of the state. So you have the half-lives, and the energies, and that gives you, exact, that are, these are just the basic quantities that you need to know. You lump them all together in what you know as the R matrix. And, um, okay, th this is just an example of, of, of parts of, uh, of, this, uh, uh, of this solution. Let's just go through that. Uh, then you have the solution in the internal region where you have this very difficult uh, 
equation, but you know it as an expansion of the eigenstates. And you have the external region where it's like that. You can calculate the wave, uh, the, the, the wave function. And then, like in the one-dimensional case, you have to do the same thing, match value and derivatives. And once you do that, you get something that gives you the wave function. In fact, you don't need to know the internal wave function. You need it to know only at this border, where, it's the, where you separate internal and external region. And once you do that, you have this perfect matching. You have the final wave function. And you can calculate, OK, it looks complicated, but in the end, it is just the R matrix, which is here. And you get a wave function, which is a function of this R matrix. And then with that, you can calculate all the cross sections that you would like to have in a rather complicated way, which is, uh, well, here, again, you have also the radial parts because you have to merge everything together. Uh, this is all nicely explained in the reference I will give you in the end. And then once you have that, uh, you have a quite complicated ma uh, matrix relationship, but in the end, you get all the uh, information about cross-section from one channel to another channel. Then you can sum together. You have reaction cross-section. You have a channel to, to the same channel, channel to another channel, or channel to whatever channel, which is the total cross-section. So all these cross-sections are given here, expressed as functions of this uh, collision matrix, which is, of course, related to the R matrix. So lots of matrices. There are different quantities that come in, which I will just skip now for the moment. And then you have this rather complicated matrix uh, element. And then we can start to do simplifications. Because uh, if you don't do any simplification, because you don't have just a single state, you have many states, and you have to simplify things to come back again to this bright Wigner, which we have seen is, is present everywhere in nature. So the bright Wigner bright single level approximation, so you do the whole matrix thing, but you say now in the end there is only one excited state, one level. And of course, this is never, you have many of them, but maybe they are so far away one from each other that they do not interact. There's no interference. So you can approximate that with this single level approximation. It's an approximation. And when you do that, the whole uh, our matrix expression for a cross-section becomes like this. And then you uh, start to, to, to put in things that you know. For example, the channel is a neutron because we have an incoming neutron. Uh, and we say we have just a few outgoing channels like uh, capture, scattering, fission. So sc uh, scattering is always there. Fission sometimes, capture very often. And you do some other approximations, zero orbital momentum. We say this cosine of this phi function, this is one of the functions I, I, I just showed here. It's like this. And if you have zero, then it is, uh, where's the phi? It is zero. We, we say the cosine is, is one. And the sinus is rho. Is, so all kinds of approximations. And when you do that, you find this expression for the total cross-section. And that total cross-section expression you have seen probably everywhere where you recognize the bright weakness expression, the e minus e0 to the square. You have a kind of width to the square divided by 4. And you have here something, depending on the reaction that you look at, you see here the different widths, uh, capture, gamma n, gamma, gamma, elastic. So you have a gamma n to the square. And fission, you have a gamma n to gamma fission. And you have also this interference term, which appears here, that we saw in the beginning for the iron, where suddenly you have a huge dip in the total cross-section. It's because of this interference term. And that makes the total cross-section going down and, and, and causing this, this, this problem. So the full ma R matrix, if you do enough simplifications, you come back to the bright weakness single level approximation. Of course, there are other approximations. And one of the most um, popular ones, let's say, because it works very well with light and heavy nucleus, is the Reach-Moore approximation, in which 
approximation, you eliminate all the photon channels, you, you lump them together. So that is something that you may see in evaluated data files, which more is, uh, is the, the most workable, let's say. Single level is the most understandable, which more is the most workable approximation. Um, so how, how do we do that? So if we measure a reaction yield, it's like that. So we have an isolated bright Wigner resonance. It is just a decay in quantum state. Lifetime is related to the width by this uh, uh, expression. But in reality, in the beginning, I already told you, there is some Doppler broadening because the, if you have some any material which is in, in, uh, in the structure, for example, a piece of metal, etc. Uh, it is moving with a thermal movement. And when the neutron comes in, it sees this moving nucleus. And that is what we call Doppler broadening. And a Doppler broadened cross-section is already something different than the, the unbroadened cross-section, which is at zero degrees. So you get this. This is the Doppler broadened cross-section is what we usually get from uh, uh, evaluated data libraries because we want to compare measurements with that. But if we do a measurement, we get other problems. We get something which is called uh, resolution broadening because you, you measure with a finite resolution. You can have the effect that the resonance is even shifted. You see that. So the peak is not observed as where you would like to have it. And in a, for a real measurement, you get, of course, real data and real data are always noisy with lots of things. So what we measure is this orange thing. We have to do some calculation to extract the parameters describing the blue thing. And that is the basis that goes into evaluated neutron libraries. Um, then, of course, this works very nicely for, for result resonances. So you have but what you measure is not really a cross-section. It's never a cross-section. In fact, it is something that is a reaction yield. Any capture, fission reaction, uh, you never measure the cross-section. You me measure a yield. And the yield is what you have to analyze. And if you do that properly, you have a kind of reaction yield. A yield is just a number between 0 and 1. It is the number of neutrons that do a reaction and the others are not counting. So either it is all of them, so you have the full fraction, it's one, or it's zero, nothing. So it's somewhere in between. And the other thing is not a reaction yield, it is a transmission. And that gives you a direct access to the total cross-section. So you have two types of reactions, either a transmission, total cross-section, or any partial reaction, which you can, in the reson which you can describe like this. And of course, they are related to the resonance parameters like that. Now, this works well for isolated resonances, resolved resonances, as we call them. And, of course, then you want to go higher in energy, and you will see that the resonances start to overlap. So you, don't, you cannot get uh, data for isolated resonances. You have something average. So what you see now, what you observe, is an average yield. And you have to average the equation I just showed here. You have to average it. And OK, that you can do. You get also the transmission. You can average it. But it is not the same thing. An average yield is not directly related to an average cross-section. There is a little bit more complicated. There is a kind of factor that comes in, which may be negligible. And then it's one, or not negligible. But you have to estimate it, especially for capture reactions. This is really not negligible. A transmission, the same thing. You have also a kind of factor. So the average transmission is not relate is related to the average uh, um, total cross section, but not in a straightforward way. So you have to do that. And what happens if you are in these resolved resonances where you have for every uh, nucleus, you have an energy, a spin parity, for example, you have a width, you have a neutron width. Uh, for unresolved parameters, you have something that is average. And then we don't talk about, uh, about particular energy with spin and parity, but we talk about a level density or level spacing for a given uh, spin particle family, spin parity family, or 
orbital momentum family. So that is, uh, we have different quantities. Instead of um, a gamma width, we have an average width. Instead of a Newton width, we have an average Newton width. And for this, we invented something else. Uh, also, the Newton strength function, which is also implying the, the level spacing. So these quantities are important in unresolved resonance regions. And just to show you a little picture how you can, uh, if, if you have here a few resonances, so d don't mention, d don't look at cross-section absolute values of energies. You just have a few resonances given here in gray. And once you sum them up, you, you, you found this red curve. So the red curve is the, is the observation, and you want to extract everything that are, is composing this red curve, which are the individual resonances here given in gray. So in this case, it's easy. They are relatively well separated. So with a nice fitting program, you can get all the information of the single resonances. But if you go, if you have much more resonances, like here, and, and with, with different widths, etc., then again, they sum up like this. Uh, now it's becoming much more complicated to get every single, so you can imagine here with a lot of, well, not so money, not so much fantasy, but you can imagine here peak positions, but you see there are many of them, and maybe some of them you never see. They are there, but you don't see them. Maybe the big ones, you see them because they pop out, but if you sum up all these gray ones, I think it's rather difficult to get from this red curve all the positions and strengths of all these resonances. So difficult. If you go up even higher in energy, you get something which is like this a smooth resonance curve. And the composing points are here. So I, I put here 2,000 resonances on this. So, so you see something that is fluctuating, but it comes really from 2,000 levels contributing to this red curve. So here, impossible to get something of that. So you need to describe that in average terms. And of course, there is, you have this, you have only resolved resonances, easy resolved parameters. Here, easy, you can get these average quantities which describe the cross section. And then you have some intermediate structure where you see a lot of things. And then you have to invent maybe some resonances which are not there, but they are you know some average properties, and you can get the same structure here, not with real physical um, uh, resonances, but at least with something that is reproducing this. And that is important in many applications, for example, in re reactor physics, where if you have a lot of material, you have important phenomena like self-shielding effects and self-shielding. You need to have this resonance structure. So you need to invent resonances and that is why there's a special section in evaluated data where you have these um, uh, unresolved resonance parameters, so which are not the average things, but it's really just invented resonances. But they are nicely flagged, so you know that it is not something real, but they have been invented. But it's working, and that is what is necessary. So these average cross-sections, so it's the same thing as the... As the as the resolved resonances, so again, this R matrix thing. Um, so you see here again the collision matrix. But the thing is, if you start to average, so you put a bar, the bar means an energy average, uh, then, then you get uh, expressions like this. So you have a bar that goes over the whole thing, but these are just constants, so the average of a constant is the same constant. But the average of one minus this UCC is a little bit more tricky because you cannot uh, average that out like this. And if you expand that, you get terms like this. You have this average matrix <coughs> element squared and then average, or the average matrix element squared, which is not the same thing. And that is the whole difficulty because from, I told you about optical model calculation where you, invent, well, where you have some nice potential so you can get this UCC and uh, from that you can calculate all the cross sections. But from this model, what you can calculate is only the average UCC, but not the real UCC squared and then average. That doesn't come out of these calculations. So this does, this doesn't. So that means you can 
with optical motor calculations, you can uh, only access cross sections which have this term in it, but not the ones with this one. And there are a few of them. That is the compound uh, nucleus formation cross section, something you can calculate, but unfortunately you cannot measure. You have the uh, uh, elastic scattering, compound elastic scattering, that you can calculate with that, but unfortunately it is always mixed in the measurement with potential scattering. So again, you cannot, uh, sorry, it's the inverse, huh? the potential in the. Um, so you cannot calculate elastic scattering directly from these optical model calculations. Luckily, there is the total cross section which doesn't contain this term, and that one you can really calculate using um, uh, average, uh, using optical model calculations. And then what is do done, you calculate this transmission coefficient, is called in optical model calculation, that is the terminology that is used there. Uh, you get uh, the different, different physical models you need to do to go to the different reaction, uh, uh, the decays, decay of these excited nucleus, and then you get other um, transmission coefficients, it's called again like that, that come in there. And then if you do an average, uh, you have something that is left here. That is what we call the width fluctuations, and that is exactly these fluctuations that we saw here before uh, that are still there because they are fluctuating but that comes just from the fact that you have too many le levels that you have to, to do. So there are all kinds of models, I go too fast, all kinds of models that calculate that but you can, uh, if you do this with fluctuation, if you do this averaging, you get out this one and that is also something that there has been progress on that in the latest years, so that is a very good thing. So now, when we talk about optical model calculations for, for partial cross-sections at high energy, it is always a combination of the, let's say, the real optical model calculation, with which you can calculate the total cross-section, and, optical, uh, and uh, physical models that model the decay of this nucleus. So this picture, I showed in the beginning, so you had here the uranium-235 plus neutron, and you see here the different cross-sections, so we see now all the peaks, we know now it's related to excited states, even this is at uh, one electron volt, it means the excitation energy is a few MeV, so every resonance corresponds to a real state at, at a few MeV above the ground state, and together, once we know these uh, resonance parameters, which is the energy position and the, the, and the half-lives of the different decay channels, or widths, that, as we call them, we can calculate and reproduce all these curves exactly like that. We can uh, calculate even the Doppler broadened cross-section when we broaden them afterwards with some Gaussian broadening, so that is all straightforward. If we go to a higher energy here, let's say the same nucleus, eh? so we have again uranium-235 plus neutron, but now we are a little bit higher in energy, and you see here you start to have lots of peaks everywhere, and you still can imagine that there, there are still uh, ex excited levels here, that there are resonances, but it's not so sure that you get all of them. And at some point, this is coming from an evaluated data library, it is not nature that, that goes so abruptly from something completely smooth to, 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 to something with, with a lot of peaks, but at some point you have to draw a limit and say, okay, now I can do not, cannot do anything more, I do some averaging, and you get average cross-sections that look like this. But a real measurement, of course, still looks like this in this region. So don't be worried if you see that, because this is nature, and this is an approximation of averages. But you see here that is exactly the same problem. You have so many levels here that you have to do something else. Um, maybe we still have a few minutes to go to something else, which is level densities, because level densities is something that is exactly the spacing between these, these levels. And with 
all these uh, nuclear models that, that try to calculate cross-sections, nuclear level densities are a major ingredient uh, to, to calculate that. So this is something you need to know. But uh, of course there are uh, data compiled, but if we have fresh data, this will help really to, 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 to consolidate uh, these, these databases with uh, nuclear level densities. Uh, in general, what we have here is uh, we, we have a spin uh, of this excited state, which is just a combination of the particles that go in. That was a neutron, which has a spin a half. Uh, we have the target nucleus, uh, which has a spin i here. And, of course, there is a kind of orbital momentum, because this neutron can bring in some orbital momentum, which adds up. And so the final spin is this, and the final parity, because every state has also a parity, is, uh, is, is, is plus one or minus one, and that depends really on the initial parity and the orbital momentum that has come in. And then we have what we call partial waves. Uh, that is the amount of orbital momentum at low energy is zero, of course, but if you go higher up in energy, you can have uh, orbital momentum one, two, and three, that become more and more probable and less probable if you go higher up in energy. So this is what we call S waves, P waves, D waves, S waves. This strange naming comes from uh, old spectroscopy uh, uh, habits. So we, this was kept in the, in the neutron physics. But OK, we all know at low energy, you see a lot of S waves. And if you go up in energy, you have even more P waves. For lighter nuclear, it starts immediately with the P waves or because there are no residences at the low enough energy. So this is something you have to keep in mind. And this picture here of the excitation energy and all these levels, that gives us the number of levels. So you can count the levels here uh, at this neutron energy, and, and that gives you exactly the neutron at the neutron binding energy, which means just above, because there you see the resonances. You can count them, and you can know how many uh, levels there are per MeV. And at the very low en excitation energy, you can count the levels again by means of other uh, experiments, by spectroscopy. You see the transition, so you can count the levels again. And then the level t density model should work over a large energy range, but you have only let's say two points to calibrate the curve. That is at the Newton binding energy. Maybe you have more, but uh, all these points are very close together. And also at low energy, very close together on this highly, uh, on this high range of excitation energies. So that means you have two points and, and you have to fit a model to, to that. So there's a lot of liberty there, let's say. Of course, there are other ways uh, that constrain these models. There are theoretical predictions that uh, constrain these uh, models as well. But the idea is, at this region, you have to count the levels, you have to select the J-Pi's, so the, the really rich type of states you excite, and then you can extract the spacing. For example, for S-waves, which is D0. You have also a D1, which is the spacing for P-waves, which is different. And all level density models, because there are many different models, everybody can make his own favorite model, but there are just two constraints. They have to go to this point and through this point. And any of these models, of course, reproduce that. The problems become at higher energies where there's no constraints, so models diverge. Um, so this picture of the cross-section giving us the, 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 the resonances also gives us an idea of the level density, because every of these peaks as you know, as I told many times now, is corresponding to an excited state. So counting these levels gives you access to the level density. So this is for one particular heavy nucleus, but not so heavy, gold, natural gold. So it goes from this. If you go to this, in this region where you can see the re uh, resonances, you can count the levels, and you get the level density. If you go to... Um, other nuclei, you see that this whole range of resonances is shifting. For the heavy nuclei, it goes to the right. For the lower energy, uh, for the lower mass nuclei, it goes 
to the right, and for the heavy nuclei, it goes to the left, which means at lower energy, so higher level density. This is a logarithmic scale. So uh, as you increase in mass, you increase the level density, except for some nuclei, like lead 208 here, because with this picture of shell model, uh, lead 208 is a very special case. It has a double closed shell, so it is extra difficult for a neutron to excite the, 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 the target nucleus. And, and that means that you observe the resonances in a much more difficult way, so you start to see levels only at a very high energy region. Um, so this level spacing is important, and you, you have to, to, to do, then you can do all kinds of tricks. Once you do the counting, uh, you see here the level spacing, so it's again all this, this picture of the neutrons and the protons. And uh, you see here it goes again from a very uh, high spacing, so it's red, to if you go to heavy nuclei, it becomes a very low spacing, so a high density of levels. And you see also, if you look a little bit closer, uh, this, this double magic nuclei, like the lead 208, which is here, you see it is a little red point inside all kinds of blue ones. So that is exactly the thing that we just saw. And the level spacing, well, you, there are all kinds of basics for the level density, but at the end, what we see is if you count the, 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 the number of levels as a function of the neutron energy, so you count the number of resonances that you see, you get something, and with a little bit of imagination, you can fit a straight line through that, and that is a staircase plot, and this is usually used to estimate this uh, level density. But sometimes there are problems, because if you go higher in energy, uh, it, it goes like this. And that means you start to miss levels at that time. So this is called missing levels. It doesn't mean the level is not there, it means just you don't see the level. That is something else. So you, you can do corrections for that, for missing levels, and uh, this is maybe something for uh, next time, and there are some things about statistical uh, statistical model, which we keep also for another time, maybe. I leave it on the slide, so if you want to see, you can look at that. But um, in the end, further reading, which is important, if you want to know everything about R matrix, you have to read this one. Lane and Thomas, 1958. It is a huge paper. It takes a while to study it, but then you know everything about our matrix. And there are another a few other books on, on nuclear physics, which are very good as an introduction to, to all these type of aspects. There's the crane. I liked it very much. And there are a few books uh, more related to, to, to radiation uh, about measurements. And this is very practical. So there are a few things there. There are a few sites where, where maybe you can find some other information. And I think it's time to stop here, and maybe there are still some questions. No questions? Okay.